Okay. So we started yesterday, all around the world, we, we started um, reading through the Torah again from the very beginning, from the book of Genesis. We, we go through the Torah week to week and complete it every year on Simcha Torah and begin again the Shabbat, the Shabbos afterwards, which was yesterday. And since this week, starting today, now we're in the, in the week of um, the Torah portion of Noah, the second Torah portion in the, in the Torah. And the, the Torah portion of Noah is primarily about a narrative that's quite famous about the, uh, the flood, which was a, a tragic event in the, sen in the sense that a, a lot of people died. And we, we speak about it, and the Torah uh, speaks about the fact there was a lot of corruption and evil and um, a cruelty going on in the world. But from a Torah perspective, you, you, we want justice, but the idea of, uh, of human suffering is never something that, that comes easy. So I want to look at this and try to, to get a, a, a little bit more of a... a in addition to the to the simple interpretation and the facts as we and the historical facts as presented by the Torah, to get more of a, a spiritual insight into it, um, because Torah is not a history book, and it's a book that should have and does have lessons for us for every day that are contemporary lessons. So we want to be able to find our own little spiritual um, niche in the in this uh, these nar this narrative which. It's, it's not an easy one. So I want to go to, I'm going to go to the source notes. I'm going to split the screen here. And just to start with, we have here, number, note number one is from the Torah portion itself. It's God says, I am bringing the flood water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which there is the spirit of life. All that is upon the earth will perish. So this wasn't a surprise. God warned humanity and told Noah to warn humanity. It took a very long time till the, the, the uh, flood began and they were all amply warned and tipped off. <coughs> and then it says, okay, this is gonna happen. There's going to be the flood. Now, a, a, a point of departure that's important for us in discussing this is I brought from the Talmud, it says a verse does not depart from its literal meaning, although there may be additional homiletical interpretations. When you look at Torah, we can interpret in many different ways. Um, and we also can drill down and find deeper interpretations, the Kabbalistic, the, the, the alleg allegorical. But it's important to recognize that when the Torah says something happened, we're not, we're not negating that and saying, well, it's all metaphorical. Or, well, it didn't really happen because that's a little difficult for us to swallow. We say there, there's the literal, literal interpretation and that remains, but putting, keeping that in its proper place, we want to drill down and find, well, like what's the story within the story? Story, the deeper story doesn't negate the, the external story, it just it amplifies and it gives us the, um, greater perspective. So, even in this week's Torah portion, Rashi, who was the primary commentary on the Torah, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, the 11th century uh, French rabbi, he's, he writes that when God brought the rains down, initially God brought them down with mercy. In other words, that the world needs rain. Water in and of itself is not destruction. It wasn't like there was uh, fire and brimstone coming down. It was water. So the idea was that even within the divine uh, will and intent, it was hopefully once it starts to rain, God would say, people will say, okay, this wasn't a joke. It's time for us to, to get a grip on our lives. In which case, the water would just be water for the earth, which is good. The people would repent, the rains would be a blessing. When the people did not repent, the waters kept coming and they became a destructive flood. So the, the, the Torah, the, this says clearly that it was destructive. And God said, it's, I'm going to destroy everything living on the earth. Rashi 
it gives us a little insight that it's not just like a, an angry God saying, that's it, you guys, are, you're done. It's, uh, you're, I love you, and I'm trying to, to get your attention and try to get you to a better place. And it, even in the, the way it was initially um, brought to the world, it could have been a blessing. It's just, it, it really depended on us. So a lot of what, what, the way this is being described is that God was giving and God was giving something that he said was it certainly was poised to be um, destructive, but it was really up to us as to whether it would ultimately be destructive or, you know, or at least in the beginning could have been shifted more to a blessing. Now, take this as um, a, a little bit further along those lines. Yeah, I get back to this. Okay. There is a to, to get a, a little bit more of a, a more mystical perspective on it, just as, as background to that, there is um, the, the laws of mikvah. I'm sure I think we all probably know that a mikvah is a, a, a pool of water, a ritual pool of water. We're in the middle of building one here in the building, and it is um, it's for purity. A ritual purity, and this they that's um, it, it really it's a, a foundation fundamental to any Jewish community according to Jewish law. So, in the laws of mikveh, it says according to scriptural law, it is permissible to immerse in any collected body of water, provided it contains enough water for the entire body of a human being to immerse in it at one time. So, if you go out to a lake, a natural body of water, a lake, a river, um, that is a mikveh. If you want to make a contained one in a in a, a building, that gets a little more complicated, but it's doable. And we have rainwater coming in, but a natural body of water is enough as long as it's enough to cover a the the, the person's body. What's that figure? We got to have a, we're we're a very a legal system. Our sages measure this figure as a cubit by a cubit by a height of three cubits. A cubit is about nineteen inches, and this measure contains. 40 sa of water. A sa is a Talmudic measurement. I think it's about uh, nine quarts um, in today's, but the, 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 in the hood, you talk to anyone about a mikvah, if you don't understand this Jewish law, a mikvah needs, needs 40 sa of water. Bearing that in mind, let's go to the founder of Chabad, Rabbi Shner Zaman of Ladi, who wrote in a uh, book uh, in, about this idea of Noah's flood. He says, think about it this way. The waters came to purify the earth like a mikvah. A mikvah is water that purifies. Well, God was putting the earth through a mikvah. Hence, the water of 40 days and nights, the scripture says it was 40 days and 40 nights of, of rain. So Rabbi Shnur Zalman says, 40 days and 40 nights corresponds to the 40 saws, which we just mentioned from Maimonides and the Talmud and so on, that the 40 saw needed for a mikvah. He said it's not an accident that there's 40 saw and 40 days and nights of, 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 of rain because the idea is that the water purifies and it's this figure of 40. And therefore, what he's coming along to say is that, think about, there's, there's something to, to say about the water being um, like a mikvah to the earth. So you want to get, and I, I remember studying this when I was when I was like 14, 15, I found it very meaningful, interesting because the story of Noah, the story of Noah, and again, it's not pretty. So it, this is not negating the, 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 what happened in the world and this human suffering in the world and what people did before the human suffering came. What it's saying is, what, like Rashi said that God, it wasn't just didn't set out to destroy. Was trying was was here said it's water. I hope this wakes you up and it'll be water of blessings. And Rabbi Vishnu Zalman took the, uh, not necessarily that idea, but that perspective of the the story within the story of a loving God dealing with with the humanity, saying that this was a purifying force. There was the the, the way to get rid of the, the corruption and the cruelty to each other was to. Um, the, give a, the, a, the, uh, a huge deluge of, uh, of water to the earth, and which God said he'll never do again. But it's it's at its core it was more of a mikvah idea. So uh, let's want to explore that a little bit because water in Torah thinking is 
is a very uh, Torah aside from the, go back to this uh, Torah for us it's it's cleansing right Torah is you take a shower take a bath it's how we 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 um, cleanse ourselves water has um it's it's life giving and I think and water is 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 a, there's something tranquil sitting by water by a rustling brook or by a river or, or sitting by the ocean there's something special about water. I think in our experience, and certainly through the eyes of Torah, something very special about water. So let's let's. I want to look at the, the very beginning of what we actually what we read yesterday in, in synagogues around the world about the very beginning of creation. If you look at Genesis one and two, first two verses in Genesis, it says, "In the beginning of God's creation of the heavens and earth." That's how the Torah opens, because the Torah doesn't. Um, um, this is just an aside. Often we'll say, you know, that the, there will be a translation of the verse, verse in the Torah, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I, I'll go with that just because I don't like being difficult, but it's actually not uh, the, an accurate translation according to the way uh, our sages um, interpreted, starting from Rashi, who's there uh, on the spot to, to, to make it accessible to a child. And what it says is, because it doesn't, the, if the world began with this bang, which, which are, are, the Torah describes and our sages describe of all mass being created in one instant. It, we, we come in after it's created. It's the six days or more of formation. The mass is then um, formed into the world as we know it. So the way the Torah begins is in the beginning of God's creation of the heavens and earth. In other words, not, we're not going to let you know exactly, we're not talking to you about that moment of creation, but in the beginning of, how, how, of God's creation, the, the opening of the curtain, the drawing of the curtain on this scene is that the spirit of God, whatever that means, was hovering over the face of the water. In other words, the opening scene that the Torah gives us is that there's mass covered by water. And as the Medrash tells us in number seven, very explicitly, when the world was originally created, it was all covered by one mass of water. It was so. This is there's there's this almost pre-creation state, even though there's creation because there's mass and there's water. But just before we get going, God said, "Let there be light," and all that stuff. There's, there's everything reality of, of our world. If we could have been looking at it, and the, the verbal uh, picture that we're given by the Torah is that it's all covered by water. Kind of like an amniotic sac. It's just it's a pre-creation state, and that, and and for all the things that the Torah says, let there be, let there be. There is no let there be water. There's there's like it's when God says let um you know talks about um, nature, light, um, the heavens, the earth, the grass, um, trees, animal life. There isn't it says and God created water. It, it that happened before verse one. It's we're introduced to water as part of the the again like the pre-creation state, almost like between the world uh, the world as it is and and its connection with with, uh, with the divine. So if you look at at, um, at number eight. Another one that the Medrash tells us is that the very beginning of creation. Praise of the Almighty ascended only from the water. It's interesting. There, there were no people. There was no anything. But it says there was praise from the Almighty. In other words, there was uh, God created water. And there was something, uh, this special um, uh, existence and this special ambiance of the world just covered by water. And it's almost, I guess it's calling it praise of God. Then, we, God created humanity and humanity spiraled out of control. So the generation arose and rebelled and God said, let these be removed and the former come back to their original place. So God said, you know something? Things were a lot calmer around here when it was all covered by water. I want to, I'm going to bring back the original water. Hence it is written, tells us the Medish, the rabbis of the Talmud, the rain was upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. So that's a, a, a very interesting thing where the, the, the rabbis of the Talmud are saying that 
the original state of the world before there was humanity is that's covered by water when god sees that humanity seems on its own of its own accord beyond redemption he says i'm going to roll back the clock i'm going to go back to this pre-creation state i'm bringing the waters where things were so calm around here i'm going to bring waters to back to to their original state and if, if you bring back waters to the original state that means we all can't live because we can't live on the water so the message there it seems to be saying something even more than what Rabbi Shner Zalman was saying before, where he said that this is a mikvah. What is a mikvah? A mikvah, usually the way it's seen, is that a mikvah is, if, uh, in, in times of old, if someone had touched, uh, a, a, let's say, a corpse, and uh, a corpse, is, it's, it's a mitzvah to handle a corpse. But the idea of coming to contact with death, the Torah says that God is life. And therefore, a person has to um, um, go to a mikvah to be able to rinse themselves of this idea of the contact with death in order to be able to come into the temple to do um, uh, 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 offerings. So that's what a mikvah is. A mikvah purifies. It purifies from what? Purifies from something that's impure. So Ra, it, it, the, the Rabbi Shazamun, when he says, it would seem, when he says that God brought the flood, 40 days of flood, which are really 40 measures of water, like uh, Maimonides taught us, that to come and purify the world like a mikvah, because the world was impure, and it's purifying the impure. The Tmedrish really seems to be taking it even to a, an even more um, refined place. It has nothing to do with impure. The waters brought to the world were the waters before there was any sin. When the opening scene of the Genesis that we read yesterday had nothing to do with anybody's sin, nobody did anything wrong. There's water. And God says, I want to go back to that spot. That's not a part of, spot of purification from anything. No sin, no corruption. It's, it's higher than all of that. So the message doesn't even say it's, it's only a mikvah. The, the medrash is indicating that there, there, there's here these destructive waters and is paralleling it with waters that were praising God, so to speak, before anybody was around. So how does that all correlate? And what's the point that the medrash is trying to tell us? So the Rebbe once analyzed this, and that's the, the point I'm going to take here. And... In order to understand that, he, what he said is that there's, there's something, the medrash here, and this idea of seeing Noah's flood and, and paralleling it or identifying it as this pre-creation covering of the earth with water is teaching us a very fundamental attitude to how we understand Torah, to how we approach Torah. It's a, a, a central lesson in, in thinking when we look at the Torah. And let's start looking at this. Number nine. The Talmud says, before the angel said before God, before this is in the, in the Talmud, the, the, God says he's going to give the Torah to the Jews in Mount Sinai. The angels complained. To him. And the angel said before him, the Torah is a hidden treasure since before the creation of the world. And you seek to give it to flesh and blood. The angels complain to God, how can you give the Torah to flesh and blood? How can you give Torah to humans? This is something that's your hidden treasure, is their language, since before the world was created. So if the Torah talks to me about putting a mezuzah on my door, what would that have meant before there was a door? What would that have meant for people? If the Torah tells us laws of what happens when my cat eats your petunias. How did, what does the Torah mean before there's a world and there's no cats, there's no petunias? There's no damages. There's no matzahs. There's no Egypt. There's nothing. What kind, how could the, what kind of Torah would it have been before there's a world? And But the concept is actually mentioned numerous times through Talmudic and Madrashic and spiritual writings. I just selected one. The idea, Torah, God's hidden treasure Hidden from whom? I don't know. But it seems that it's, it's this mystical idea that predates and others that actually transcends the world as we know it. 
Torah we have is very much apply, applies to the world as we know it. Right? The stories, the facts. Physical people were enslaved by physical people in Egypt. They got out of Egypt. They got a Passover. You got to eat physical matzah. It, it addresses the world. The idea that this somehow predated all of that? Is it, what does that mean? And brought another one. There's a verse in, in Proverbs in number 10. It says, it, it, this is like um, the way it's read. Is like, it's like the Torah speaking, saying, I was a nursling beside him and I was his delight every day. That God took delight in the Torah every day. And, and there also, on this, the, the rabbis see this as, as beyond the Torah, the, the, the worldly applications as we see it. But Torah speaks in a higher key too. Torah speaks in numerous keys. So in other words, thinking of it this way, I, if I'm moving into a house, the Torah says, you're moving into a house, you need a mezuzah. And Torah law tells me the right side, how, how to hold the, the, that, all of that. That's correct, real, literal, and that's the Torah in the practical key. What these, this piece of Talmud or the Medrash is telling us is that whether I can understand it or not, the Torah also speaks in a higher key. That's beyond, it's, it's the, the spiritual concept of mezuzah, but it's, it's not anchored specifically in having a door and a house and a physical piece of parchment because th that didn't exist before the world was created. There is a more transcendent key in which the Torah can be read. And one of the great Kabbalists, the Italian Kabbalists in, in, uh, in the uh, 11, 1100s, Rabbi Menachem of Thano, he writes in number 11, the Torah said, essentially addresses the supernal reality and hints secondarily in the lower realms. So he, and this perspective, and he's not the only one with this perspective, but he's the most prominent um, uh, quote of that perspective, turns our whole understanding a little bit, I was going to say upside down, but it's really inside out or outside in. It, what he's saying is that the Torah speaks in a key that's spiritual, that's transcendent, that for our purposes is otherworldly, and it also hints at worldly. The idea is that, yes, there's, there's a mitzvah of mezuzah, or mitzvah of matzah, and, it, and all of that is absolutely true, but that's the tip of the iceberg. And the more one studies Jewish spirituality, the more one under, tries to understand the Torah at its core, the more one starts to understand the world from the inside out. To look at the Torah and say, the Torah tells me how to put up a mezuzah. How to keep Shabbos? How to, 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 um, uh, to eat matzah? That's all true. But it's the beginning. There's so much more of understanding of what the soul of that body of mitzvah or of Torah is. And the Torah, for the, 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 to those who can access a more spiritual plane, the Torah speaks fundamentally in a more transcendent way. To go back to uh, Menachem Fano, it's the languages essentially addresses the supernal reality. In other words, Torah had its place perfectly before there was a world. It spoke its language. And, and it hints secondarily in the lower realms. Now that also, what, we, what is Torah? Does it mean only mitzvah? A matzah? Does it only mean mezuzah? Or does it even mean the stories of the Torah? that the, the elements of the stories of the Torah are Torah ideas that fleshed out and materialized in the stories of the Torah as we, we experience them, as the Torah describes them, which were real, live human beings and practical things, not metaphors. But the Torah means the entire Torah, all of it, even the story of, of Noah. It, that ex pre-existed. Maybe not with a guy named Noah, but the idea of this, the, 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 this, the essence, the spiritual essence of that, Rabbi Menachem Afano is saying, it essentially is, is a, can be read in a supernal key. And it hints in the lower realms in the story that we're going to read, the shops. 
So what does this mean? If you th think about it, so now that the Torah it can be read in a higher key and a lower key. So in a higher key, then the, the higher key, there's really, if God, the Torah talks about evil. The Torah talks about a lot of evil. But the Torah idea of God creating the capacity for evil, there's no, there's no evil in God. The evil that, that, that we see in the world is a, a divine creation, a, the idea that God created us and gave us life and gave us capacity, including the, the capacity for free will. And the capacity for free will means we can do things that God doesn't want us to do. And therefore, there's a capacity for evil. And God creates us all. And God creates, gives us the opportunity for evil. But as the Psalm says, you are not a God who desires weakness, weakness. evil does not abide with you. So there's no evil in God. So when the Torah talks about evil, and it does, in the supernal language, in reading in the higher key, there's no evil there. There's, there's God. And God is not evil. And God is, it loves us. And God is, is, is giving. And God is goodness. And the way things can translate down once this becomes a partnership with humanity is that, that evil exists. But the idea of God, Torah in, the, in its higher key, there's no evil there. And it's somewhat uh, parallel to what Maimonides tells us. He says, there, and this is also a fundamental Torah idea that he, he lays out. He says, no, he says, there's no difference between, and Timna was his concubine. Timna is, is in the stories a little later in the book of Genesis, there's someone named Esau, um, who was the twin brother to Jacob. He's not an easy guy. He's a, you know, not going to call him a bad seed, but he, he, he certainly is not painted well in the Torah. And he and his, his family, there's a lot of destruction coming out of them. So we talk about his son, um, it was, it was Aliphaz, so it says Timna was his concubine. Now it says that Timna was actually his daughter, and he's he's having sex with her. It was there's so much incest and craziness going on there. So Timna, this woman, represents a lot of very very degraded and immoral. It, it, here that she, she's his daughter, not his wife. This is his concubine. You don't want to go there too much, right? So it, it but that's Torah. The Torah says that. His Hebrew words, the Timna is a polypilagish. The Torah tells us about Timna, Maimonides says. But there's no difference between that verse talking about someone living a very unholy, immoral life on the one hand, and compare that to also to another verse. I am the Lord your God, the first of the Ten Commandments. Our here Israel, meaning Shema Yisrael, which we know is not holy, right? It's in the Mezuzah. It's, it's, it's something we say, it's a prayer. On the other, he says, when you come to talk about the core holiness of Torah, there's no difference between one verse and the next. The, the first verse of the Ten Commandments is holy, but and so is the, the, the so are the words that Timna was his concubine, because it's all Torah. What they're describing, one is describing immorality, one is describing morality, that's something else. But it's all coming out of God. And if God is good, then at its core, everything is holy. Since they're all, to quote my mind is here, since they're all from the mouth of the Almighty, and is all the Torah of God, it is all the Torah of God, complete, pure, and holy true. So we have to get our minds around this. What Maimonides is saying, and what these other these other quotes are saying, is that Torah at its core, we, we have to understand Torah as it's presented to us, in its simple sense, in its literal sense. But understand that. Torah is all given to us by God. And it's not a history book. And it's, it's God's expression to the world. And we are not capturing everything when we open and read a simple text. Because Torah is the blueprint of creation, we're told. I didn't put that in here. Torah is, is divine expression to the world beyond uh, uh, me and you and, uh, and, uh, and our house and Timna or anybody else or Abraham. It's something, it's a, it's a God's expression to the world. And reading it in a divine key, 
means hearing. You have to hear the simple interpretation, but then hearing something that's a little transcendent, where there is no evil. So this helps to explain uh, somewhat something that is something I, I struggle with uh, uh, for, with uh, to some extent for a good number of years. There's there's uh, the Torah in two places goes through some um, length goes to some length to describe negativity that will come that can come as consequences for negative actions, and the Torah it's it's really it's heavy stuff. It happens once in the book of Leviticus, once in the book of Deuteronomy, and the practice actually is that the reader um, takes that aliyah. You know, we don't give someone an aliyah for that. The reader takes that aliyah. It's it's it's, it's always um, it's always mine because I'm the reader. Because you want you don't want to give that reading to someone because it's just so nasty. It begins with a little bit of good, ends with some good, but in the middle is really nasty. So. And here, take a look at this. It says, and I didn't put the whole thing here, but you see it's from verse 15 to verse 67. And it will be if you do not obey the Lord your God to, to observe, to fulfill all his commandments and statutes, which I'm commanding you this day, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. In the morning, you will say, if only it were evening. In other words, you can say, oh, I can't stand this. I just wish it was evening already. In the evening, you'll say, if only it were morning. In other words, not, we're not going to have peace because of the fear in your heart, which you will experience because of the sights that you will behold. Okay, so that's, that's, that's frightening. So the, there is a Hasidic story. This is what I used to struggle with more. That the Alter Rebbe, Alter Rebbe is the name we use. This is from the, uh, the Rebbe's book, Daily Thoughts. Alter Rebbe is the name that, uh, Alter Rebbe means the old rabbi. Um, that's the founder of Chabad. Rabbi Shnazam is known uh, within Chabad as the Alter Rebbe. Alter Rebbe himself was the regular Torah reader. In Shul. Once he was away, and his son, who would eventually succeed him as the Rebbe, his name was Rabbi Dover, and he became known as the Middle Rebbe, and that's going to show up here, that's why I'm saying it. His son was young then. He heard the Torah reading from another. Somebody else read, stood up and read, read the Torah, right? People could do it. When his son heard the curses that were coming out of this section, and in Hebrew it's known as the Tochacha, section of admonition. His anguish at the curses in the Tochacha, the section of admonition, caused him so much heartache that on Yom Kippur, the Alter Rebbe, that is whether his son would be able to fast. He's, he was overcome with, with, with terror when he, when he heard the verses that were being read from the Torah, that, this, the admonition, which we read twice a, a year. When they asked the son, known as the Mittal Rebbe, don't you hear this reading every year? Well, it's not, it's not new. We heard, we, we've seen this movie before. He replied, when father reads, one hears no curses. What does that mean? They're there. The curses are there. What the Rebbe offered is that he, he was able to hear in, in, in his father's reading, the Torah in the higher key, where every verse expresses something positive, even though the way it translates into our realities, it's, it's, it's negative. But that it's, it's the holiness is there. And God is good. And when he hears it from God, the hears, he could hear it in a godly key, it didn't bother him. And there's something which we could somewhat make it analogous to something, a story in the Talmud. It says, Rabbi Shimon Ben Yechai, who's the, the, the author of the, of the Zohar, he said to his son, there's two noble people, Rabbi Yonatan, Rabbi Huda, the men of no noble form, meaning wise and learned individuals, go to them so they will bless you. So he sends his son, Rabbi Lazar, who also uh, ended up being a, a, a very um, great sage and mystic, he says, go to these great rabbis, let them bless you. He went and found them. He, they said to him as follows, may it be God's will that you should sow and not reap, that you bring in and not take out. And there's a whole list of things that are so, they're really nasty. When he came back to his father, he went, he says, to his father's the great Rabbi Shimon. He says to him, not only did they not bless me, they even caused me pain with their negative words. They were, they were not nice. His father said to him, tell me exactly, what exactly did they say to you? He answered, they said to me such and such. Rabbi Shimon, said to his son, these are all blessings. 
And there in the Talmud, the the it, there in the Talmud, the the uh, it lays out, it spells out how these were all cryptic blessings which appeared to him. And, they, and it would appear to us to be curses, but there was there were blessings within them. And, and, and we could go through, it's not difficult to understand, but it's, not, it's a little off topic. The idea is that you can hear things in a different key. And sometimes it's in the hearer, and sometimes it's about something being translated into the reality. And as we're going to say, I'll say soon, but I, I, I guess I want to bring it up now. If, if one of my grandchildren comes to me and asks me for a jelly belly, or for a candy, and believe me, I, I, I totally want to do give them the jelly belly and let their parents deal with, with the, the grief. But sometimes I have to say no. Well, it was my kid for sure. But with my grandchildren, I'm a little a, a less, uh, you know, a, a less in the, in the uh, discipline position. But if so, if I have to say no, is it that I'm being cheap? Is it that I'm trying to punish them? Is that I'm trying to teach them a lesson, or is it that I love them, and I'm pretty sure that this is not going to be good for them right now. So into their in their world, it translates as pain. That ogre is not giving me a jolly belly. In my world, it totally generally, there's no negativity at all. It's I love you, and that's why I'm not giving you a jolly belly. There's there's this communication gap. But they're both totally, both totally legitimate. Of course, he wants a jelly belly. I didn't give it to him. I'm the ogre. Until he gets hopefully older, or she gets old enough to be able to know that I wasn't an ogre. But at, at, on the spot, there, there's no, I'm not talking about a case where I, you know, talk about a healthy parent. They, they love their kid. They want to do the right thing. And out of love, sometimes you have to not say no. It's two different keys. And we're going to get to the again also, but I, I put it in a little later, but I feel it, it's important to, to talk about it now. There, that's even with, with all of this, what, what uh, we're saying over here is whether it was the, the rabbis or Rabbi Shimon or the, the, the case with, with the, the, the Torah reading, it, how we hear it and how we experience it is one thing. Hearing it from God's key, that's not a curse. And Rabbi Shazalman himself wrote in, his, in a book that according to the truth of the verses, and the underlining of that is, the bolding of that is from the Rebbe, they are only blessings. It doesn't say also blessings. That they're blessings. These verses that come across to me and you as kind of scary curses. Because we're hearing it through our ears and in our reality, which it's designed to be for us. But from to hear it in God's key, as the psalm said, there's no evil there. So based on that, one of the things that Rebbe brought, he said, go back to, to, to the, uh, we said before that, that Rebbe Shner Zalman had, um, had uh, compared the, the flood to a mikvah. 40 days, or 40 measures, 40 saw of water. A mikveh, as I said, conventionally, it's to bring purity. You bring impurity to something or someone who's had contact with impurity. But actually, that's not the only way. A mikveh is actually not only about uh, curing from impurity. A mikveh is about ascending from level to level in our own spiritual connectedness. Sometimes it's ascending from a place of impurity to purity. Sometimes it's, it's, it's going from one pure place to an even more pure place, from one loving place to a deeper, more loving place, so to an even more intimate place. And an example of that in Jewish law is, I'm quoting here from Maimonides, the high priest would immerse himself five times and sanctify his hands and feet 10 times on that day. That day that we're referring to here is Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur will pray five times. The, the, those who hang around for the end of the Muslim service, you'll see there's a lot there. It's, uh, it's uh, a lot going on in the temple. And the, the, the centerpiece of all that is a human being 
was a high priest who conceivably is, is, is the, the paragon of human purity. Going through the service on Yom Kippur, the high priest went to the mikvah five different times. Why? Not because the high priest had to get away from impurity, because the high priest was, was scaling a ladder of purity, was going from one level to the next of holiness, starting off at, with Kol Nidre, and then try, then going even closer in the, in, in the intimate bond, the intimate Yom Kippur bond with God. And then going to the, the to, to, to the shachs, to the musaf, to the mincha, e each one of these times going to the mikvah again to be able to find a closer connection. So therefore, the idea of what, what Rabbi Shnu Zalman uh, uh, wrote, that it's, a, it's 40 days of, of, of rain, uh, 40 days and 40 nights of water because it's a mikvah, doesn't have to be that it was a mikvah from impurity. It's the mikvah, it's the water like the pre-creation mikvah that the Mandish told, told us about. It's, it's all purity. It's all good. It's the water that existed, that covered all of our mass of the earth before in the very big moment of creation was before there was any sin, before there was any disconnect, before there was any corruption, anything at all. It was just beautiful, a creation, God's creation covered in water, and in the words of the Medrash, praising God. It was beautiful. There was no negativity. And that was the water the Medrash is saying, and Rabbi Shazam is saying, that the that's the water of, of the flood. The idea that God said, I'm bringing that back. Now, did it translate into into what it translated into? Yes, it did. And that's a reality, and we're not glossing that over. And it's a difficult, painful thing to think to read every year. But what the Medish is saying is, don't forget there's a higher key. God's not just some angry tyrant. God loves. And even in the giving of the flood, it, the, the way it is, we're reverting back to that beautiful, serene, scene of water covering the earth, pure connectedness. And to quote the Rebbe here, 19, a simple example from human life. A parent loves a child and only wants the best for that child. Sometimes a child's behavior requires the parent's love to be expressed in a way, in a way of discipline, I'm sorry, um, and which the child experiences as dislikable pain. In the parent's world, this is pure parental love. And the Torah teaches that withholding parental discipline is a deficiency in parental love. Sometimes that's the expression of love. Allowing a child to do something self-destructive is not caring about the child. It's caring more about that. We, I don't want to be in, in, in an uncomfortable situation. And, uh, and, and I don't want my, my kid to be angry at me. And therefore, I'm going to do, let him do or her do something which is, this, is self-destructive. That's not real love. Real love is to be there for the, for the, even when it's uncomfortable, to be there for the, 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 the benefit of the loved one. So there are two ways of reading it, as I said before. There's how the child reads it, which is legit, but there's going on in the parent, which is totally legit. It's two different keys. And in that sense, the, the idea of, of the, the, the waters of Noah while the reality is what it is, and the historical fact is what it, what it was, and the pain and, and the loss of these this, of the people who live very corruptly in, in, and cruelly with each other, but that did exist. But when we're talking about Torah, we're talking about God. Let's remember there's a higher key. That's what the message has come to tell us, and it is alluded to also in our in the scripture, and I. Brought up a, a little bit more here. There's a verse in Isaiah. It says, With everlasting kindness will I have compassion on you, and your redeemer the Lord, it, it said, said your redeemer the Lord, for, for this is to me as the waters of Noah. It's pretty interesting that he calls the waters of Noah. The waters of Noah killed a lot of people. What are the waters of Noah? It's, it's, the, it's the, the flood. And here God is mixing into everlasting kindness, having compassion. 
you know, and that's why I wept out. It, it's it's it, he, the, the the verse in Isaiah is is hinting there's some there's a there's a, another key here, and the medrash goes to it beautifully in, in twenty one. When it's talking about this, is the book of Echa. The book of Echa is is the book of Lamentations written by Jeremiah. We read it on on Tisha B'av, the saddest day in the Jewish calendar. It's about destruction, but it ends off in a hopeful note, and it says, "Return to us, us to you, your Lord. Return us to you, Lord, and we will return. Renew our days, as of old." We say the gods, you know, we like the good old days when we were together. Let's go back to the good old days. So, you know, it's, it's see, I, I don't want to lose anybody in the Hebrew here, but there's there's a play on words here in the Medrash, because there are in the verse, um, in uh, in in um, in Lamentations, that says as the days, as the days, it's four letters. It's kine. It is the word. The word of four letters can be split into two words of two letters each, which is ki me. Ki me means as the days. Ki me, there's two words, means like the waters. So it says like this, as in the days of old. What do you mean as in the days of old? What are we asking God? Oh God, we want to be back together with you like in the days of the good old days, days of old. As in the days of Noah. As it is stated, for like the waters of Noah, Kimei Noah, this is for me. So he's saying, the, the message is saying that, that here when we talk about a book of, that talks about destruction of the temple and the, the horrors of what happens when the, the, the Babylonians and the Ro eventually the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the, 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 the murder, the, 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 the I, I hate to overuse the word Holocaust, but the, the terrible slaughter that went on there. And we're reading the book of Eichel. And we come to the end, they say, God, we want to be connected with you again. We want to go back to the times of connection, the times of King Solomon, the times of Mount Sinai. What is it the, the, the Medr says? Look at the play on words. What's the days of old? The days of, of, of like with Noah. And the, the reference is to the waters of Noah. What does Noah were in God? It was also, it was also destruction. Unless the waters of Noah can be heard in a different key, and I just end ended off here with two quotes here about the beauty of the water and what water means to us symbolically. And we are uh, this is a Torah portion of waters. So this is a week of, of thinking about the water and thinking about the water and reading the Torah portion, saying, "Here, here's how water killed a lot of people." who lived corruptly and cruelly and so on, but still the fact is that they died, which is a painful thing to read. But the water, water is not, water it is, has a very holy source. And even this story can be read in hierarchy, but the water itself, if you take a look at Maimonides, how he ends off his laws of mikvah, he says, one who focuses one's heart on purifying one's soul from impure, impurities, but that, he's not talking about going into the water right now. He's talking about what we can do today without going into water. It's spiritual water. Becomes purified when one resolves within one's heart to immerse one's soul in the waters of God consciousness and knowledge. It's waters and immersion in water and being covered by water is a metaphor, Maimonides says, and we're going to read another one. It's a Torah metaphor for being immersed in goodness, immersed in higher thinking and higher consciousness, in, in positive attitudes, holy attitudes and selflessness. And as a matter of fact, Maimonides, as he ends off his entire book of laws, he ends with the, book, with the laws of Mashiach, when the world changes for the better. This is the end game, this is the goal line. And he, what does he write in his final words? In that era, there will be neither famine nor war, this is the, the, the time of Mashiach. Envy or competition for good will flow in abundance. The occupation of the entire world will be solely to know God. As Isaiah states, the world will be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the ocean bed. So it, it, it doesn't mean that in times of, of, of Mashiach, we're going to have another flood. 
what it means is that they're going that this in the good way, that there will be we will be totally uh, uh, submerged in higher thinking, be covered and and surrounded and immersed um, in, and entrenched in in positive thinking and higher consciousness and how we care about each other and how we understand the world and how we understand ourselves. That's called being covered at, by the knowledge of God as the waters covered in the ocean bed or in the mikveh or however you want to, want to put it. So the idea of, of water in the Torah is consistently a metaphor for what, what is, water to us is life. Water gives life. We need water. As I said, that's that from the amniotic sac, sac to, to, to someone going through life, we always need water and water gives life. And God forbid, when there's no water, that's, that's a big problem for, for the entire ecosystem. Here, in the, this week's Torah portion, we see how water translated into something that ended up being destructive. At its core, it's, it's, a, it's, obviously, it's a blessing. We, we look to have that immersion whether through an actual mikvah, which is a beautiful thing, and also within ourselves, uh, to immerse ourselves within the waters of a higher thinking, and the, to connect with the, also to connect with the, the higher um, key in which even this week's Torah portion can be read. That Torah, it, God is giving with love. And it, it translates on the on the the user end, on the retail end, it was very destructive. And God, as a parent, made made God's choices. And and that, and that, and that there's no I can't gloss that over. I can't whitewash that, so to speak. But we want to at least be mindful of the fact that there's a higher key to read, as the Medrash told us. So we'll leave it over here. If there are any questions, you can uh, fill in those. Um, I'm not seeing any yet. So I just want to mention that I, I do plan sooner than later. I don't know if we'll be in time for next week, but we don't. We want to go back to in person to a hybrid. Uh, for for years we had the Sunday mornings um, in person. Um, the format would remain something like this. Maybe not exactly this, but it would be with with text. To, it would be a little more controlled. But um, it would be, we would have access, people would meet in person and there would be access through Zoom. And I'll keep you posted about that. And Wait. Someone want to ask something or is that? It? Yeah, this is Steve. So I, I was wondering um, the source of Rashi's commentary, commentary, is that supposed to be something that they derive themselves or are they revealing commentary provided to Moses? You're talking about Rashi? Well, both, but Rashi to start. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's, that's a, it's a, a, <laughs> it's a great question. I don't know if we could do it in five minutes, but I'm going to try. <laughs> um, the, when the rabbis of the Talmud or the Medrash gave us interpretation it was often things interpretation that was passed on because the all the 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 talmud the medish all that was it was carried orally for a long time well over a thousand years so then what they're doing is they're carrying they're they're, they're putting in writing a traditional interpretation I, rashi that's the rabbis of the talmud and the medish rashi is uh, uh, Seven hundred years later, and Rashi doesn't it doesn't is not is not in that line of of transmission of oral transmission. Rashi is a tremendous Torah scholar, so and Rashi's primary purpose, as he states himself, and it probably came up in our classes, is he he is out not to teach uh, a complicated. Uh, Torah, uh, 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 seminar. He wants to make the Torah understandable and accessible to a five-year-old. That's what he writes. So he only chimes in 
when he thinks that there's a, a five-year-old, a really smart five-year-old, would have a problem with <clears throat> the flow of the verses. So he usually, either he's going to draw from Talmudic sources, or he's just going to give a logical explanation. In this specific case, it wasn't a logical explanation. He was drawing from a medrash. But he explained it to the child because it, it, it was he felt it was necessary. Now, why did he feel it was necessary? I don't remember that one specifically, but there are books written in Rashi. It's fascinating. A good number of books, because if he chimes in, it means he had a problem. And sometimes that's a challenge. What was his problem? Why, can't, why couldn't he have left it alone? And so, Steve, I can tell you for sure that I, if I went next door and to look, because I don't have any of them here, I could go online and find them probably also. Um, the, there, there are um, age old commentaries who will explain w- why Rashi had to bring in that idea that initially God wanted to just kind and it said, let it be this way. And, and then, you know, hopefully it'll bring them back. There's some nuance in the verse that, he, that Rashi was saying. A kid's mm. not going to be able to totally understand this. Rabbi, mm-hmm. can, can I ask a question? That sure. I'm not sure how to formulate, but um, if if you are reading Torah, you know, virtually for the first time, yeah, and you're taking it in with Rashi's commentary, yeah, and your guidance through sermon and you're taking it on that level yeah it is is the way to hear it on a higher level through through study does it come from your soul does it come from your intelligence it is does it come from uh kabbalah all the above jane all the but I, here, here's what I would say: that the best way it was absolutely it would be it's beautiful to study the Torah on a week to week basis just with Rashi. Right. Not not to complicate things, just get it down. What get is it Rashi down. Telling? He's yeah. not he's not he's not overlaying. Now you dabble. Someone said this. Someone said that. That's great. But the right. foundation of it all is understanding the Torah according to Rashi, because that's really, that nails down, so we have the foundation of understanding Torah. Right. And, and then there's, there are a lot of different writings and, uh, and uh, right. rabbis, and everybody's got an opinion, you know, so there's yeah. a lot, there's a lot to, to study, and it's beautiful, and that, I, that's, I, I, I try to spend as much time as I can trying to, to dig deeper, but it all starts with Torah and Rashi, and in order okay. not to, to Overcomplicate things if one is just, as you said, just doing it for the first time. Torah and Rashi, perfect. Okay. That I get. And uh, Kabbalah, real quick. Yeah, sure. Kabbalah and real quick don't really go together. Well, just... (laughs) I'm kidding. Well, okay, okay, okay. But is, is that... Is that... I mean, I can do two things at the same time because I'm an old person, you know, why not? So is that something to study? Do you, I, I would as think our that. rabbi advise it? Is it, I mean, I know really nothing about it. I, so Kabbalah is, it, it's, uh, it's holy. It's a mystical key, core key of the Torah. Huh. Um, I would not, so a lot of what we discussed, including what we discussed today, Right. Um, uh, uh, traces back to Kabbalistic concepts, including right that, that rabbi from Italy. He's 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 a Kabbalist. I know we had a quote from him. Right. So there's, but the thing is that, in at least in in many circles, including uh, in, in here, it's just a, as a studying Kabbalah straight up, is not uh, uh, um, not advisable, and, and including for me, because it's so dense and so cryptic it's very easy mm. to to go off base with it yeah. I, I i every day i'm studying kabbalistic concepts but through the guidance of of people over the generations who made it who fleshed it out so that i can get my mind around it and and, yeah. and, I, and get it 
in a, in a in a in a solid way. So I may go look for a footnote at the Zohar or something like that, and I do, but I'm really I'm not. I'm going there to see what was explained to me already, and I want to see it in its original context. Yeah, I, so I, I hear you. So I wouldn't go there, but there's yeah. a lot of spiritual stuff. Once one has, if, if you have the story of Noah down or part of it down with Rashi. So you have that secure. So flipping around and reading other stuff or listening to a, a, a talk, that, that can't hurt. But it's, it's right. on a solid foundation that you know what the Torah is saying. Right, right, right. right. Okay. See you Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> now, I just got, I, there's a, someone asked in the, in the, in the text, in the, the, the chat, how many Jews died in the flood? There were actually no Jews at that time. Jews, as, as we know, Jews really only um, uh, was at Sinai. That was like a mass conversion. But as far as the Hebrews, Hebrews started later with, with Abraham. Noah was a monotheist, but, and, but there were very few of those. Um, and they, so they were all in, in the ark. So that's, uh, we don't have, that's, that's all we got. All right. So we'll leave that. Wish you all a great week and a great Thank year. Thank you very ahead. much. Thank you, yeah. Rabbi. Okay, be well. Bye-bye.